This podcast is brought to you by Startup Socials, a global community of entrepreneurs built to connect and empower people in the startup ecosystem. Hello, everybody. This is Igor Shaifod, and we now have Dan Olson with us, and uh, we hope that he's going to tell us stories that you guys are neither going to believe nor going to forget, because I think the book that Dan wrote actually bridges the gap between knowing what uh, a lean startup is and knowing how to build it and what the certain trade-offs and shortcomings are. So without further ado, let me present Dan to you. And uh, Dan, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Dan Olson. I'm the author of the Lean Product Playbook that just came out from Wiley. And I have a long career of product management. Basically, started out with a technical background and went to business school at Stanford. Um, and been working in the Valley ever since. I worked at Intuit for a while, um, leading product management for Quicken. And I've been at startups uh, a lot since then, helping out startups as a consultant um, in product management. A lot of times as an interim VP of product management, I did that for Box back uh, in 2007 um, and a few other companies. And then I took a brief stint from consulting and did my own startup for a while and um, returned to consulting again and, and always had a lifelong dream of writing this book. And um, over the last year, worked on that and, and got it out. So I'm excited about that. Uh, can you talk to our wonderful audience about um, what is the main difference between uh, telling people what products they should build and uh, working with the big or probably small companies, not, not necessarily the size of Microsoft, and then on the other hand, really just uh, doing it all yourself versus uh, telling others? Mm. Well, basically, when you get to really big companies, it's a lot more about change management. Right, so or, or you know, a more mature company. So I definitely have had clients um, that are trying to, you know, they uh, they know about agile, they know about lean startup, they want to embrace the principles, and they need help with that. So there's a lot of coaching, um, process definition, helping people with templates, active coaching in meetings, um, following up one on one with people. So that's that's a certain kind of um, helping people be lean. And then when you're doing it yourself, um, you know, basically my startup, we kind of, we did it out of the back of my house. We had seven desks from Ikea back there. It was like your traditional stereotypical kind of uh, startup. So that was a lot of fun because you, know, you, when you make a decision as a team, you can implement it right away. And so, you know, um, even though that startup, you know, d didn't uh, IPO or anything like that, one of the things I'm proud about is how quickly we move. We, we iterated very, very quickly. And you know, a customer would tweet something, we'd see the tweet, we'd fix it, we'd launch it and say, hey, it's fixed now. So very rapid iteration. And then when I work with, you know, my sweet spot is usually like post-series A startups, like when I work with Box and I'm working with a new client now. And there, it's really working with the, the executive team to understand what's their vision for their product and then helping them um, kind of make tough calls and prioritize and define that and then turn around and work with the designers and developers to um, you know, decide, design the product, and again, checking back in with the executive team, and then working with the developers to to uh, to build it. And so it's um, it's a lot it's a lot more about advising and suggesting and recommending. But for the most part, people are pretty uh, open minded because I'm I'm listening to what they're saying and recommending what's in their best interest and what I think makes the most sense. So I don't have as much direct control as when I did it myself, but it's it's a great way to have a big impact. And um, I kind of stumbled into consulting because I was, after my third web product, I was like, okay, I'm a technical guy. I've been coding since I was 10. I just haven't learned these web programming languages. Let me go learn HTML and PHP and MySQL and Apache and Photoshop and all this. So I just literally was taking 20 hours a week of classes and I got an offer to be head of product for a startup. And I was like, hey, why don't we just work out some hourly thing since I'm taking all these classes? So I kind of stumbled into doing it. And one of the side benefits was just the rapid learning of working with one startup and then another startup and then another startup and learning what they were doing right and what they were doing doing better or worse. Um, so it was great. So I have I'm a guy, I kind of have a unique vantage point of seeing what a lot of different startups are quite a lot, a lot of spaces, different sizes and stages are doing to compare notes with them. Uh, one of the most awesome 
things about uh, the Lean Product Playbook, uh, your book, is that uh, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think compared to, for example, the, the, lean, st the lean Startup, it's more of a, uh, I mean, it is the playbook, but it's sort of uh, the cookbook as mm -hmm. far as I'm concerned, right? Because uh, you are essentially saying, hey, here are the right moves, here are the right ingredients, etc. cetera. Uh, one of the not so intuitive but brilliant things in uh, the original The Lean Startup book was that uh, while you absolutely have to test and listen to your customers, you should be really careful as to how much of a listening to your customers, especially to your particular customers, uh, you should be doing. So uh, that always interested me that subtle difference between just really being agile and uh, being friendly to the customers and on the other hand really understanding where you're going versus you know asking 5,000 or 50,000 people where you mm -hmm. should be going. Um, in terms of your playbook uh, how would you explain this supply? What, uh, what, is, what, what are the main rules there? Well let me just show the book maybe I can just show it to people. This, this is the book Lean Product Playbook it's got a whiteboard cover. Um, and, you know, I think there is a balance to be struck between having empathy for your customers and having a vision, exactly like you said. And so I think there are plenty of examples of companies that were not customer centric at all. And some people thought, hey, this would be a cool product to build. And they spent a lot of money and time and people people's effort to build it, they launch it and they realize mm, they're really, you know, there's a lack of product market fit. You know, my book is basically about how to achieve product market fit. And, uh, and, um, and the Lean Startup, you know, Eric Reese did an awesome job um, kind of sharing a lot of ideas, some of his own, some of which he built on from Steve Blank and other people, but really packaging it up in a way that people could really understand to try to make building a successful business and building a successful product more of a science than an art. But I found a lot of people, they read the book, they get excited, they understand the high-level concepts, and then they go to actually do the detailed thing, and they're not quite sure what to do. So the analogy I use is like going to a gym. It's like you, you know, January 1st comes around, you want to get in better shape, you join a gym, you buy some workout clothes, you show up at the gym, you have no idea what to do. It's not because you're lacking motivation. It's not because you don't understand that you need to work out. You just don't know the details of what to do. So that's why my book is a playbook. So what I advise actually... Um, it is basically a guide to product market fit. And the interesting thing is a lot of these lean concepts, there's not like an agreed upon definition, like even MVP. Like you ask 10 different people what MVP is, you'll probably get like six or six to eight different definitions. And you see these debates online about an MVP. Landing page is an MVP. Landing page is not an MVP. And the funniest thing is product market fit is another one of those concepts. It doesn't really define much. You know, Mark Andreessen coined that term in a blog post a while ago, and um, Eric used it. And, and so the whole book is a playbook on how to achieve product market fit. So the first thing I had to do is say, okay, let's define what the heck that means. And so there's a model in the book called the product market fit pyramid that has five levels. The product market fit pyramid at the bottom of it, the, the two layers of the pyramid that represent the market at the bottom is your target customer, and above that is your underserved customer needs. And you have to have some hypothesis or sense of what that is. And I think that a lot of the products that have been built and launched that didn't succeed, it's because people didn't really understand their customers or what their needs were. That being said, back to your, your question and your example, if you don't have any kind of vision or hypothesis about how to provide, you know, better, better meet their needs or provide a better product, then you just go out there and randomly talk to people, just talk to people, they're not going to guide you to the promised land. You know, so in the book, I talk about a lot, uh, a lot of quotes from Steve Jobs and Apple, which is typically, they like to say, you know, people like to say that Apple doesn't talk to customers. Um, but what I point out in the book is even if they don't necessarily proactively solicit a lot of feedback from customers, I think they have a very robust, detailed understanding of what, who their customers are and what's important to them. And so those aren't inconsistent. As long as you're right, <laughs> if your hypotheses, if you're being kind of thinking about what's the customer benefit, and, uh, and how your product's going to be better than the other products that are out there, and you really have a good mental model of your customers and all, how all those needs work, then you can do it. And so what I, the analogy I use in the book is basically customer feedback won't lead you to the promised land, but it's kind of like a flashlight in the dark. Like you're, it's going to keep you from falling off a cliff and you know, tripping and falling, right? And so the whole point is to how to strike a balance between having a vision, right, which a founder, an entrepreneur, product leader, GM has to have, a product team has to have of, how are we going to create a product that's better than what's out there? You have to have some vision, 
but it has to be rooted in a target customer and in, in the needs that they have and how you're going to meet those needs better than other products that are out there. The central point to, uh, I think one of the central points, correct me if I'm uh, wrong, uh, to your book is that uh, you, you need to have specific frameworks, specific ways of thinking, specific, um, again, specific frameworks that really help you navigate this very, very unmapped area of startup, especially, I suppose, correct me if I'm wrong, especially early startup, because very, very early on, you mm -hmm. are babe in the woods and you, you think you know where you're going, but, but you sometimes don't. So the question building up on the previous question is, uh, how soon should you start getting customer feedback? Are, are, are there any rules for that? You know, like Steve might like to say, get out of the building. Are there no solutions in your building? I mean, I think you need to get, you need to talk to, let me, let me rephrase it. I would say you need to talk to customers as soon as possible. Whether or not you get customer feedback, customer feedback implies you're getting feedback on something. And so what we typically do is, is dif divide up that talking to customers into discovery. So, which I'm not necessarily showing them a mock-up or a wireframe or any product, but what I'm doing is I'm forming my hypotheses about who are my target customers and what are their needs that aren't being met, that I don't think are being met in the marketplace. And I talk mm -hmm. in the book about um, an importance versus satisfaction framework you can use to kind of quantify how underserved these needs are. And I talk about the example of Uber. You know, Uber did a lot of things right, uh, execution-wise, product-wise, but I think one of the biggest reasons that they're so successful is that they basically met a huge underserved needs. And, and I talk in the book about how if you ask taxi riders how satisfied they were with their experience, with their driver, with the safety, with how polite they were, with the payment convenience, there'd be multiple dimensions that you can easily imagine if you did surveys. People would say, no, I'm not satisfied at all, right? And, and yet getting a ride is very important. So anyway you form hypotheses about what those underserved needs are for your target customer, and you can go out and talk to people, right? So in the case of Uber, say Uber thought, you know what, we really think we can provide a better ride experience for people. They could go out and form hypotheses and say, you know what, I don't think people are satisfied with the level of safety, courtesy, and they can go and talk to people, one-on-one -on -one interviews, and say, hey, tell me about your last cab ride. Tell me, you know, how happy are you? They could do surveys, potentially asking people to rate how satisfied they were, and they could kind of get evidence to back up their hypothesis that, yeah, there's really an opportunity there. That's before you even have a solution idea, right? You're just kind of validating the problem that you're trying to tackle and refining your understanding of your target customer and what their underserved needs are. So that's what we call the customer discovery interviews, um, watching people, talking to them, asking them about what are you using today, what do you like about it, what don't you like about it. That's all discovery. And then, you know, once you feel good enough about those hypotheses and then you get clear the next level up, that, that's the market basically. And then in your product, the product market fit, the third three layers of the product of, at the top part of the pyramid basically are your value proposition, which is, you know, which needs is your product gonna meet in a way that's better or different than other products? And then the feature set that you're basically gonna do. And then a user experience that brings that to life. So at that point, you'll, you'll eventually, you'll form hypotheses there and you'll, you know, either create wireframes or mock-ups is what I advocate. The whole point is like you don't need to code. You don't need to just jump in and code. There's an intermediate way to reduce risk by using, you know, medium fidelity wireframes or high fidelity mock-ups and getting feedback. And that's the other part. That's the next time that I would really kind of do customer touch points would be, okay, great. Now I have a wireframe that brings my MVP to life. Let me go run this by customers and see if this particular solution that we've come up with to better meet these needs resonates with them or not, or how well it resonates with them. And all this is iterative, you know, it's never, you know, I like to think of like a, like a bow and arrow and a target. You're never gonna hit the middle of the target. You're never gonna get a bullseye the first time. Just don't even try, right? Just get the arrow on the, on the target and then we'll iterate from there. And it's all about how quickly you can iterate in both, mm -hmm. both those areas, both the discovery interviews of validating the problem and in your customer feedback to get feedback on your particular solution approach. I think what's really good is that your book doesn't just talk about this in theory, but you actually offer, uh, once again, a cookbook. You say, you know, for how, how many minutes you should talk about this, what to show to the customers, what kind of 
questions to ask to them, right? What to repeat? What is the sequence of, of, of things, right? And I think uh, to me, this is uh, really valuable to somebody who's not just sort of in theory thinking how wonderful it would be to build something, but to actual <laughs> startups who are down there in the trenches. Yeah, I mean, all those details come out of. Uh, a few things. One, me working on products myself, figuring, you know, working through those and trying different things and figuring out what works. I've also been speaking, you know, on these sub subjects since 2007, and I would pay attention to the questions that I would get, and I would get questions about like, how much time should I spend, and what questions should I ask, you know. So again, it goes back to like the gym membership. Like, I know I need to talk to customers. I'm down for talking to customers. What do I say? <laughs> like, what do I ask them? So I do talk about that, and. Um, and so it comes from that and also from my client work, working with all these different startups and all these different companies and seeing what are the patterns of the questions and issues and challenges that come up the most that keep them from you know, working out at the gym, keep them from actually um, practicing lean startup principles. So um, yeah, that's, that's where that stuff comes from. The content has been iterated on for a long, long time. Like I said, I started speaking since 2007 on these topics. And even before that, working at Intuit had a lot of these ideas and tried them. Um, some worked and some didn't and iterated them. So, so the content's been worked on. Um, actually working on the book, taking the time to write the book actually helped me improve the content even more. So like that product market fit pyramid, that wasn't even fully uh, developed as a concept until I sat down to write the book and I tried to tie it all together and have a single cohesive approach. Same thing with like the MVP framework. You know, I talked for a bit about how you see these debates online about is a landing page an MVP? It's not, it is, and people arguing. Um, I have a matrix in there that basically addresses all the different types of MVP tests you can do um, and quantify and describes and categorizes them on four different dimensions so that like basically it's like typical elephant situation. Like you're talking about the tail, you're talking about the trunk, you're both talking about an elephant and you're, you're arguing about it. Um, so it, those kind of frameworks are new um, that I had the time to create for the book um, above and beyond my talking, uh, you know, the presentations that I would give. And, and looking at the book, it is very much of a manual for the product. Really just anybody who is building or was building or is planning to be building a product, I, you know, my very sincere recommendation for you guys to get it, and we're going to have the link that you can click on and uh, just get it on Amazon. Uh, but uh, one question always, uh, or at least for the last few years, uh, I, I really wondered about this one question. But I feel that uh, more or less people could be divided into the product people and the sales and marketing people. And, and uh, I'm sure both in small organizations and in large organizations, there there is some sort of dynamics between the people who are out there selling, who are creating, uh, you know, distribution partnerships, uh, PR, pro uh, PR products and you know, who are doing the PR, who are doing the selling, et cetera, et cetera, and the people who are the product people. And very mm -hmm. often there are some serious fights between them. Very mm -hmm. often there are the really, really wonderful relationships uh, mm -hmm. where people really help each other, where they really work as a team. Um, uh, the question to you, um, any good hints uh, for those situations, any uh, interesting suggestions, any rules, or maybe any resources where uh, people working on both, so to say, sides, the, the side of the product and the side of selling, marketing, PRing, should look into? Yeah, I think, you know, I think to extend your model even more, I mean, I think you can find, you can definitely find sales driven organizations that are out there where, you know, at the extreme, sales comes in and says, hey, I just signed a multi million dollar deal with company X. Here's what you need to build uh, product and engineering. That's totally. sales. That's sales driven, basically. Um, so, you can also yep. have engineering driven organizations where the engineers just say, "Hey, I think it'd be cool to build X," and they just build that. And uh, you know, and then you can have. So those are the kind of the example. The, the what I would say when one function has too much weight, if you will. And so, product in my mind kind of sits in between those two, and it's your job to say, "Okay, like what's the market saying, and what's possible, and you know, like be a little strategic." So the sales team could be out there selling deals and signing up and committing to different parts of the product, but they're not being strategic over looking across and saying, okay, are we building this for just one, one client? Or are we looking across all of them and saying, what are the patterns and what do we want to do? Back to your question about what's our vision 
that's basically being completely market driven, customer driven, um, and you may not want to do that. So, so product management uh, in general, um, their job is to kind of sit between there and, and figure out what is the market saying, what is our strategy, uh, what can we do with engineering resources, what's feasible, what's the ROI of these different RDs, what's the business case, you know, and then the other important party is designers that help bring whatever it is the user experience to life. So. Um, a lot of times when I talk about this stuff, it's a lot of Venn diagrams of all these functional people over on top of each other, and they have to collaborate. And if anyone is too empowered, then it usually is not, there's dysfunctions that result. Not to say you can't build a successful business that way, but your odds are lower. And uh, if you're at a sales-driven organization, you're probably going to have better salespeople than engineers and product people. If you're at an engineering center organization, you're probably going to have better engineers than you are sales and product people. So... Um, my biggest advice is just, and you know, the, the, back to your thing about advice is to try to align people, and that's again what product management's job is to align people on what are our objectives and what are what success mean and what do metrics mean, and if you can help drive a conversation and get agreement that hey, these are our success metrics, and maybe that can help inform the decisions and get people on the same page, um, you know. So that's that's the piece of advice I have. But at the end of the day, I, just being honest, if there's a place you're working in that's too skewed one way or the other, my best advice is to go to a different place that isn't so skewed. You know, and I think that you know the other thing is in early stage startups you see less of that because usually the CEO or founder is like a single point of contact, and they're not going to be in conflict with themselves about sales and engineering. So it tends to be when you get larger that you can have those things happen. And one other aspect um, I forgot oh, oh, to mention uh, on that, Igor, is the, compet the competitive landscape, right? So that's right. your sales Absolutely. guys could be telling you X, Y, and Z, and you're doing it. Meanwhile, this competitor over here is eating your lunch on strategy. So it's not only your own internal strategy, but looking at the trends in the marketplace. And even if, you know, a lot of times, you know, there are books like The Innovator's Dilemma and things like that, where you're just so beholden to your current marketplace that and all the kind of muscles in the organization get built around serving this market that may be declining and there's a new market or you need to shift your market or shift your technology or shift something, your value prop, and you're missing out and some other competitor is going to come up. So it's also a competitive aspect to that as well. It's really, really great that you uh, mentioned the innovator's dilemma and uh, obviously, obviously the lean startup is another great uh, book to look into. Um, any other suggestions, one or two books, uh, beside your wonderful book that uh, startups really must read and really must have on their desk? Definitely, yeah. So, you know, when I came up with a lot of these concepts working at Intuit, I was at Intuit from 1998 to 2003. I, that's where I really developed this importance versus satisfaction framework because I had a lot of researches, resources at my disposal to do qualitative research and quantitative research, and we had the time to figure out what the product strategy was that was going to create the most value. A few years later, 2005, I, I happened to come across at, at the Business School Library this book called What Customers Want by um, Tony Ulwick, or Anthony Ulwick is his full name. Basically, for me, I was excited because I came up with importance versus satisfaction on my own. And then here was this guy who uh, worked at IBM who also came up with importance versus satisfaction frameworks. A lot of similar ideas. Um, and so that's a good book. Uh, other good books, um, I mentioned in the book, uh, Jeffrey Moore, Crossing the Chasm. Um, Absolutely. It's all about the technology uh, adoption life cycle. And then his book after Crossing the Chasm was Inside the Tornado. So I kind of like Inside the Tornado a little bit better because it builds on Crossing the Chasm. Um, and then another book I really like is UX for Lean Startups from Laura Klein. It's also a very practical book. It's like if you want to develop wireframes and get user feedback, it kind of walks you through how to do it with a lot of tips, you know. So that's a good book too. Awesome. Um, Dan, thank you so much. Uh, I, I would say that uh, everything you guys want to learn from uh, Lean Startup and how to actually play it and how to cook up the products you can learn in uh, Dan's book. So we're going to have uh, the link to uh, Dan Olson's The Lean Product Playbook. Thank you so much for being with us, for uh, telling us to keep calm and keep iterating. <laughs> That's right. That keep calm and continue iterating. Yeah. And um, thanks for including the link. Thanks for taking the time. And if people want to learn more, they can go to leanproductplaybook.com also to learn more about it. And, uh,
Thanks a lot. It's been great talking with you.